Welcome to Disney's Four Scores. I'm John Burlingame. This podcast series brings together the most accomplished film and television composers working today and reveals the emotional journeys, inspirations, and unique challenges of their work. I'm particularly excited about today's podcast because it's a chance to talk to one of today's most sought after composers, someone who has already won an Oscar, an Emmy, and three Grammys for, respectively, Black Panther, The Mandalorian, and his work with Donald Glover in Childish Gambino. It's Ludwig Göransson. Thanks for having me. It's always great to talk to you, John. The Mandalorian is a terrific piece of entertainment, and of course, music plays a huge role in its success. So let me start by asking you, what are your earliest memories of the Star Wars movies? The music. I remember hearing the Darth Vader theme. It had a tremendous impact on me. The Imperial March, obviously, and um, it transformed me. It took me to a different universe, different planet, and that also got me really into the movies. And that's how I also discovered John Williams, and which eventually led me to uh, also getting into classical music. So was the Star Wars trilogy then sort of your entree to film music, which would eventually become your career? Yeah, it was in high school where I really listened to Star Wars and John Williams in particular. And, and I remember asking my teachers, like, where can I find more music that sounds like like this and the first thing they guided me to was Gustav Holes, the planets and then I started going on, on like a classical journey after that so let's cut straight to the Mandalorian I'm dying to know how did you get the job I I'm not sure where the chronology is if you had done Black Panther at that point and whether there was any connection between the Marvel Universe and John Favreau's work there, and the Star Wars Universe, which John wound up doing The Mandalorian. I think the connection was just John Favreau and, you know, he was working on Lion King, hanging out and working with Donald Glover a lot. Also, John was obviously in the Marvel Universe, so after Black Panther, I guess my name must have come up in conversations with both Ryan Cooler and Donald Glover. So that's, I think, how it stuck inside John Favreau's head. So when it came time to do Mandalorian, he gave me a call and just asked me if, if we want to take a meeting. And I don't think he, he mentioned what it was about. And the first thing I see is just John standing in a room completely covered with artwork from the Mandalorian. And I was just, my eyes is just huge. I mean, I, I kind of underst understood from that moment on. It's like, okay, this is something extremely exciting about to happen. So uh, what kind of conversations did you and John have? Do you remember? He talked about the world. He showed me the pictures. He showed me the characters, his vision. He talked about what he's been listening to. He's talked about what he's been watching, his inspiration while writing this show, like old samurai films like Kurosawa movies and, and also old westerns and kind of just opening up his, his mind to me and just completely like sucking me into his world and into this uh, image that he has in his head. And uh, it was awesome. So when you sat down to start conceiving music for the show, had you read all eight scripts? Yeah, I, I you know, one of the first thing I asked, like, what, what do you want the music to sound like? And he had a big harp of moment about kind of what Star Wars meant to him and what the music meant to him and how he wants the music to, to be different. And we want to try new experiments and take new risks. But most importantly, it needs to still have the soul of Star Wars. Um, yeah, how do we do that? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> uh, Did you start? trying to find a musical signature for this lone bounty hunter? I started by going back to kind of what we talked about in the beginning of this interview, trying to remember what Star Wars is to me, what is the soul of Star Wars. And by doing that, I had to connect with kind of my inner child. You know, I don't want it to sound cheesy, but like remember the feeling I had the first time I heard Star Wars and the first time I saw 
all those visuals and and try to connect with that memory. And one of the ways to do that was for me to make music the way I did it when I was a kid, which is basically just locking myself into the studio away from the computer and just be surrounding myself with instruments and instruments that I can play myself because that's how I used to uh, write music when I was about nine and 10. I would just have a portable recorder put myself in the basement and just play drums, guitar and bass and, and just uh, feel like time was disappearing. I guess that's one of the reasons why I kind of gravitated to the recorders because I guess everyone used to play them as a child. It just gave me more options in terms of something new to try and I bought a set of five different recorders and in the mail came like a huge package which I guess was a bass recorder. I didn't even know that I ordered one of those, but <laughs> I had never seen it and I never played it, but I gravitated towards that in the beginning and, and just the sound that came out of that was just so special. I just couldn't stop playing it. And the first two days of recording, I was just completely shut off. I was sitting with those flutes for probably like six, seven hours just playing. <laughs> I can't play like the, a lot of technical melodies, but I remember just playing rhythmical ideas, like with intervals back and forth. Like, probably was driving my engineer nuts, but <laughs> it was really fun. So why do you think the bass recorder was the right sound for the Mandalorian? In the beginning, I didn't, I didn't know that it was for the Mandalorian. I was just kind of blown away by the timbre of the instrument and how fun it was to play and how cool and different it sounded. I mean, one of the first things I did was the intro for the theme song, which is just the bass recorder intro. My first thought was like, okay, this is cool and fun, but this <laughs> this is extremely simple. It feels very far off from Star Wars. I knew that I wanted to do something different, but I still wanted the music to be, how to say this, like harmonically complex and like intelligent in a way. And I was very hesitant in the beginning after I did that first recorder intro that it was just not interesting enough and it wasn't like complex music. So it wasn't until I finished a whole song and I decided to put to make that recorder part and put that as an intro to the song that I was like, okay, well, now this section actually has a purpose to the whole composition where I felt like it fitted in. Wow, that's fascinating. So you actually had pretty much written the whole theme then, incorporating the bass recorder, before we figured out that that would sort of be the Mandalorian's signature sound. Yeah, no, exactly. I basically had to make the whole like theme song. <laughs> I didn't know there was a theme song first. That was the first song that I did out of, out of like many others. The theme has almost kind of a march-like feel to part of it. Am I right about that? I think something that really resonated with me when I read the scripts was the primal feel of it and the primal feeling of, of the Mandalorian. He's not really sh showing a lot of emotions. He's a bounty hunter. He's out hunting, getting money, trying to get paid. That's why I was like, okay, let's make the beat kind of sound like a, like a heartbeat, like a primal like heartbeat march. <laughs> And then there's that great two-note ba-boom. I started with the flute, and then the, the next instrument I went over to was just the drum kit, and I played that doom do do doom do do doom do do doom because I was like, I knew I wanted a heartbeat. And then came the da dum because it's just, it's, uh, I, I, play, I, I remember playing that on the piano. I went from the drums to the piano. It just, it, it feels like an introduction, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then came the melody. I recorded that on the piano. So I made the verse basically, and then I wrote a little uh, bridge that led into the chorus, which uh, I guess the chorus is kind of like the homage to Star Wars because I kind of wanted it to be like a fanfare sounding thing. Yeah, it's um, kind of triumphal. Yes, exactly. It's also like I wanted to incorporate a lot of emotional elements in this one song. I wanted this song to tell a story, basically. There's a lot of different emotions that, that you go through on this composition. 
Yeah, and that's one of the things that I think is most fascinating about the theme. And it ends with this sort of magical chimes kind of sound. Yeah, which is a Fender Rhodes, you know, from the 70s. It's just a, such a fun instrument. And that's kind of, you know, like John Williams always used the celeste and yeah. <laughs> to make that kind of magical feeling and, and feels a lot like nighttime or space or, you know. Every time I hear the celeste, I feel like I'm laying on my back on the lawn looking up on the black sky with stars. So that's, I think, the roads is kind of my answer to the sound of a celeste. It's so great because the theme in and of itself is uh, is its own kind of journey. Yeah, you're, you're right about that. So he's a bounty hunter and he's alone mm. most of the time with this very mysterious past. And we never see his face until very late in the first season. And yes. I'm wondering, how much you felt your music had to help tell what was going on in his head because we could never see. I know. <laughs> I wrote most of these songs and most of the themes just by reading the scripts and talking to John before they started shooting it. You know, if I would have started writing music to the picture, it would probably have sounded very different. I like writing to scripts because you write in a different kind of form. I tend to write more music that sounds like longer structures and longer ideas. You also start thinking in your head like, okay, well, I need to hold back a little bit. It's too busy. But I, th I think for, for this show, it was kind of the opposite because he was wearing a helmet the whole time. So the music kind of had to do the opposite. I already had the themes and the music kind of written and it was just about the production mostly. But. Every time I, I was writing to picture, I kind of always felt like, oh, I need to do more. It needs to be more active. I can fill it up with more instruments, with more orchestration, because it helped telling his emotions because you didn't see them. You never saw his face. So can you talk a little bit about the Mandalorian soundscape in general? Because I know that there's not just the theme here, there's an orchestra involved and, and I guess probably some electronics too. Can you talk about why that breadth of music making was right? I wrote about five or six songs that had a lot of different themes in them and I played every instrument. After I did that, I hired three musicians, Ryan Kilgore on percussion, Pedro on flute, and uh, George Deering on guitar. And really, I think what's, what's really exciting when you, when you start working right into picture is to have your own unique library of sounds that you draw from. And also something we were doing a lot, especially with Brian Kilgore, was that we were like kind of experimenting and like I was recording like cymbals that we, we dipped in water and we recorded just different timbres and rhythms and, and different ways of playing them. And like the, there was a percussion instrument called the, the boom bap or the boo bap or something that you can hear it a lot in like the second episode of season one. It kind of like sounds like desert, like a Middle Eastern desert drum. And uh, to me, describing the soundscape of Mandalorian is difficult because there's so many different instruments and different parts of the world that these instruments are from and different genres. So it becomes is like a, this huge melting pot of music styles that are all just kind of tied together by production and the orchestra. So when you say production, are, are we talking about taking the sounds and manipulating them or distorting them? Or what, what do you mean by that? Okay, well, how do you take Middle Eastern drum and take that with European style orchestra together with distorted guitar and the bass recorder from like the Baroque times and make that sound like one piece of music? The only way to do that, I think, is by the way you produce it, the way you're gluing them all together, but also a lot of synths and tech elements, like the tech that I use a lot. Yeah, let's talk about that. You also have electronics playing a role here too, right? Yeah, I have a lot of uh, modern elements, and I guess that's also what I'm, what I'm calling the production. The, the production is like using these modern techniques, these modern elements of recording, these modern sounds, these modern synths, these sounds that I use when I record or produce a, an album or an artist, and how to use them in film score and how, how I can use them together with an orchestra. That's always a challenge, and it's always something that gets me excited. 
So talk a little bit about the orchestra and and where you felt you needed to bring that in and what role they play in the overall scheme of things. I knew from the beginning that I wanted an orchestra involved on every episode. That sound is Star Wars. You can't recreate the first Star Wars trilogy without an orchestra and, and make it feel like Star Wars. That's impossible. Fortunately for us, Lucasfilm knew the importance of that and uh, we were able to work with us 72-piece orchestra for every episode. We did recording sessions here in LA. It was so fun. The first season especially is a really orchestra-heavy season. And it's so great. I do want to ask you, how many instruments are you playing on most of these scores? I think on every episode I'm playing at least a couple of guitars, bass, drums, three different types of recorders. I also play like some soprano recorders that are pretty cool. A bunch of like different 70s synthesizers. I think there's more guitar in The Mandalorian than in any other Star Wars score to date. And I'm wondering, yeah. is that because at, in its essence, this is kind of a Western? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, maybe. It's not purposefully done like that. I think I like, if you don't know by now, I like different ways of coming up with ideas. <laughs> the most boring thing for me is to just sit in front of the computer on a fake keyboard. I do it every day and 12 hours a day. It's so un uninspiring. You're sitting there playing on this like plastic keyboard and seeing these notes appear on the screen in front of you and you're not getting anything back like you have a one-way conversation it's like it's not really a way to to write music when you start playing a real instrument and you're taking your mind and your vision off the computer screen you connect with this instrument with the wood with your fingers touching the the fretboard or the piano keys it's um more of a profound experience and, and you can feel like you're connecting yourself. And I think it makes a difference yeah. in what we finally hear merged with the picture. I hope so. <laughs> Disney's Four Scores is brought to you by the Four Scores playlist, featuring music and interview clips from each composer featured in the podcast series including Ludwig Göransson's score for the Disney Plus series, The Mandalorian. The Four Scores playlist is available on all major music streaming services. Experience the magic behind the music you love whenever you like. So I have to ask you, what was your initial reaction when you first saw the character that became known as Baby Yoda? Oh my god, um, I was <laughs> freaking out. I knew how big this was going to be. And then uh, John's genius idea of, I don't know how he did it, but like, it was a secret until it actually hit the screen. That kind of surprise is just something we don't really have anymore in today's world. Did you write a theme for him? Yeah. It was one of the things I did when after I read the script, and I wrote his theme. I put it in the first episode when you see the baby and it was completely wrong. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So what did you do instead? It was tough because I was really fond of the theme that I'd written for the baby, which also was kind of a homage to John Williams. I mean, not as good to my standards. I was, you know, trying to talk John into like, well, maybe try to listen to it one more time and like, but I was pretty adamant that it was not going to work because he wanted the music to come from Mandalorian's perspective. And so I had to go back to the drawing board and start fresh. And it's such a incredibly important scene and special moment. So I think I came up with 10 different versions of a new baby theme there. And I think I played John all 10 different versions and nothing was right. And then what I did in the end was to shut the TV off and didn't have the picture in front of me and sat down with my guitar and just played different chords and the different arpeggios on, on the guitar, and which kind of made it sound like old but modern. And I presented that John was like, this is it. 
by that time, like when you worked so long on something, you can't even judge what you're doing anymore. But John heard about 10 to 11 different versions, and the last one was perfect. That ended up becoming the, the new baby theme that you hear in, in season one. So that hints at what we will eventually hear in a full version later. I describe it the baby theme from Mando's perspective. Before he had any emotional ties to the creature, we're experiencing this discovery of the baby through Mandalorian's perspective. He's not like, oh, look at this cute little baby. He's like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and that's what the music had to portray. So what about the other subsidiary characters that we meet along the way? Cara Dune, Grief Karga, Moff Gideon, do they, do they all get their own themes? Moff Gideon definitely has a theme uh, that I was pulled my hair out writing. It was fun, but it had to be special, and it's prominent in end of season one and season two. Is it hard to write a theme for a villain? When the theme that people have on their mind is the Imperial March, yeah, it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it was it was a struggle because I knew it needed to be something ominous and something dark. I also kind of wanted it to be like a cool rhythmic pattern. I mean, the Imperial March, the staccato and the snare is like very prominent. And that I started with like a hip hop, like a 808 snare sound. Oh. That is playing this rhythmic pattern. And one of the things that always gets me excited and gets me to think outside of the, the ordinary ways of me writing music is to do like different time signatures. So a lot of the time signature in, in Mandalorian, but also especially for Moff Gideon's theme is 15 eights. Wow, that's unusual, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty, I mean, it's not used that much in film scoring. When you have a, like an interesting time signature like that, it makes it more easy for me to like, use a simple two note chromatic melody, like da 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 da. If it's an interesting time signature, I was like, okay, well then I can let that slide. We visit so many different planets across the mm. two seasons. Does the geography also require a specific musical sound? Absolutely. The visual is so astonishing on this show. Like this is the first time that people have been able to experience these kind of visuals from their couch. You see this incredible planets, the moon, the ship flying over these big sand dunes. And this is so beautiful and easy to just write these like transitions when you go from one place to another but they all have their own little sound, yeah. So the end of season one, episode eight, it ties up a lot of loose ends, but we also get our first look behind the helmet. And of course the climax is so thrilling and also moving. And I'm wondering yeah. if you could talk about the challenges of that last episode of the first season. There's so much action and I've established a lot of themes already for it for the show and a lot of sounds and like I want to play through all the themes and I want to kind of button them up and it's tough because it was also so much action so there's almost like wall-to-wall -wall music in, in that episode. That's like the, also the moment where the baby and Mando are really connecting in a different way so it's interesting because the, the baby theme that I wrote that was completely wrong actually worked perfectly for this moment where you've been on their journey together and see them bonding and Mando actually this creature means something to them. Yeah. So talk about season two, which is of course equally fun because so much happens that none of us could have predicted. Did season two require any different approach? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, it did. May, I mean, new themes maybe, new instruments, new sounds? First of all, I was not even sure that we were gonna be able to record orchestra at all for season two because of the pandemic. It wasn't until like the very last minute that we were able to open up the scoring stage again and get the musicians out there. And we had to record it in a little different way this time. And then for some reason, I felt like the second season, it just felt a little darker. Oh, sure, yeah. I think made me change the instrumentation around a little bit and 
maybe in season one we were a little bit more adventurous, while now in season two we're more serious and more darker. Did that require a different musical approach? I think it was also the times, and I was more writing everything by myself. We were not in the same room as the director, or I was not in the same room with the musicians. I think I used actually more synthesizers and more guitars because I was just kind of locked into to the studio. So speaking of the filmmakers, did you interact with Favreau and other filmmakers uh, on a weekly basis to sort of figure out what they were looking for for each episode? How did the collaboration work? This was our first time I collaborated with John Favreau, and anytime we step into a new project with a new collaborator, the most important part is to really get to know each other. Fortunately, season one was before the pandemic, so we were able to spend a lot of time together in the same room. And for every episode of Mandalorian, I drove down with my team to the editorial suite. John Favreau and Dave Filoni, they were in every meeting. And just before watching the episode, we just talked about what it was about and what they're trying to say and what they're trying to do. And then we watched it together and spotted it. All the playbacks we had when they listened to my music, it was me going there and presenting the music to them and really get to know each other. And it was extremely important because when that came about, season two, we already had this great report of working together. So I could tell just by looking on John Favreau's face if he likes something or doesn't. Oh, that's great. So when we get to the last episode of season two, someone very special arrives. Yeah. And, and there we hear you quote John Williams. I think maybe for the first time, I'm not sure. Uh, was that the first time you quoted a Williams theme? It was the second time. Second, what's the first? The first time is in episode five when they talk about Yoda for a little bit. Did you quote the Yoda theme? Yeah. Oh, I gotta go back and see. <laughs> it's when they're sitting talking about Grogu's past. Grogu and uh, Rosario Dawson. She's playing. Uh, oh, ah ah Ahsoka? Yes. Ahsoka and Grogu are sitting around the campfire and they're talking about his past. Oh, that's so cool. So then in episode eight, you use the Force theme, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Was there any question about that? What was the thinking behind quoting John Williams? No, there was no question about it. John and I and Dave, we talked about it in other episodes. You know, when's the right time to do this? And I think this was the one moment in the last episode of season two where we all agreed that this is the right moment to do this. You know, you want grown men to sit at home and cry or raise up from the couch screaming. And the way to get that reaction is to really pull the heartstrings at the right time. Well, you certainly did. I mean, we were screaming on the couch at home <laughs> when Luke Skywalker showed up. Another great secret that was kept until the last minute. Just extraordinary how that works. I know. I don't know how John does it, but I do I do know that when I worked on it, it was like blacked out for, a, for like the longest time. You couldn't even <laughs> see what was going on. I love the fact that season two ends with your theme played by strings in a kind of classically styled version. Talk a little bit about that choice. It's such a crazy big emotional roller coaster that you go through at home watching that episode. And I just wanted the end titles for, for that episode to give them a place to breathe. And I think changing up the main theme for that and just giving it this beautiful classical uh, reiteration uh, was the right thing to do. As time has gone on since you started scoring films, I'm thinking all the way back to Fruitvale Station forward, have you become more confident in your musical ideas or was that confidence always present? I mean, I, th I think it was always present, but I think I know how to use it more now. The, the more experience I get and the more I know myself, the more I know how to use it. I guess you can call it the force. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what I mean, it's like 15 years ago, like I, or 10 years ago, like I loved what I was doing and I had, was so excited to be doing it. But nowadays, if I'm working and, and if I'm writing something and I'm not having fun, then I know I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. Well, one of the things I want our listeners to know is the degree of commitment that you make to your projects. And I think there's no better example of that than Black Panther.
And I wonder if you can sort of uh, scroll back the time in your mind to when you got that film and where your research into African music took you. I remember when Ryan signed on, Ryan Coogler signed on to do that movie. It was extremely exciting. Um, you guys had already done a couple of films, right? We'd already done Fruitvale Station and Creed and a bunch of student films, but you know this is on a completely different level. I was one of the first people to read the script that Ryan wrote, and immediately after I read it, I understood that in order for me to make this work justice, I need to learn more, I need to research, I need to study music, especially African music. And the only way to do that was to go in person um, to Africa. I went first to, to Senegal. I've actually, I've been there before, 15 years ago. I studied music in Gambia for a month. So I knew how important it was to be there in, in person and to live there and, and to fully connect. And some of those sounds that you created, and I think maybe even some of the music you wrote while you were there, wound up in the film, right? Yeah. Through a mutual friend, I got in contact with an incredible musician named Baba Mal, and he invited me and my wife Serena to go on tour with him. She's also a musician, so we traveled around these really rural, incredibly beautiful villages in Senegal for about two weeks and just saw him play these amazing shows in the middle of the night. He is, the set started about four in the morning every night. I got to know his band, and as soon as we came back to Senegal, I rented Baba Mal's studio and started recording some of his musicians in the studio. The talking drummer I work with, his style of, of playing and this way his drum sounds is only because it's been passed on from generation to generation. It's a bloodline. His, his family is a bloodline of musicians that through hundreds and hundreds of years. And that goes for most of the musicians that played on that score. The score obviously needed more, right? You needed an orchestra and I think maybe some choir too. How did all that sort of depict what you needed to show in terms of Wakanda and the characters and the action? Well, it's interesting because Wakanda is obviously a fictional country, but I, I mean, you've never seen a big budget film portraying African culture and Africa that way before. It's like this uncolonized country in the middle of Africa, and it's the one of the richest and most technologically advanced country in the world. And what would music sound like in a country like that? So that was one of the reasons why I also incorporated the orchestra, the modern production techniques and modern instruments and synthesizers. Recording these instruments was really important, but also just getting understanding about what the music means and what the purpose of the music is in culture was equally important too. Yeah. And you, I think quite appropriately, won the Academy Award for that. And what was that like, <laughs> winning an Oscar at the age of, I think, 35? Uh, no, 25. <laughs> Sorry, 25. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. Uh, no, you're right, I was 30. I think I was 35. Uh, <laughs> maybe 34, actually. I mean, I don't know. Um, it still feels like a dream. I can't really believe that it happened. Will you be doing Black Panther too? Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to be there. And will you be doing the third season of The Mandalorian as well? Same answer. I mean, I think they're shooting right now, and I love the show, and I'd love to continue on that as well. On a different plane, you spent, and I can't believe this, a year and a half on Tenet. Yeah. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what it was like to work with Christopher Nolan. He's kind of like a film music legend, because... The way that he and Hans Zimmer has, has worked together to craft and create these audio and visuals together that changed cinema forever and, and inspired so many other filmmakers and studios to, to try to make movies that sound and look like that is crazy. Definitely his movies and Hans Zimmer's music to his movies has definitely had a huge impact on my career and always been a fan of their work. And to just get an insight into his mind and how he works, yeah, I had to learn so much. 
Is it possible to say what you needed to do on Tenet and how complicated it got? It was is easy and, and complicated at the same time. The easy part is the collaboration ship. Like Christopher Nolan really knows what he likes and what he doesn't like. And he is also really good at communicating and pushing boundaries and coming up with ideas, like a whole other vocabulary in terms of like mixing music into a movie in terms of how you use the subs and how you use the side speakers. It's like an open book of knowledge. But after reading the script and immediately understanding how inversion plays such a big part in the storyline and also visually how you see inversion portrayed, I knew that musically that was a big way for me to experiment and there's so many different ways you can invert music and that's what the big challenge for me was how to invert music and make it listenable and enjoyable but also fitting for for the movie and also at times the inverted music that I wrote also I wanted to be able to play same reverse and forwards if you take a scene and put it on your computer and reverse it I want the music to sound the same way I put the bar pretty high in terms of like what I wanted to achieve and how I wanted it to sound like and Chris pushed me and I pushed him and it really felt like just a lot of fun times I guess we should say for people who maybe haven't seen Tenet that it's a complicated spy thriller that involves moving backwards and forwards in time. And that's, I think, what you're alluding to when you talk about inversion, right? Exactly, yeah. You're, you're, sometimes you go backwards and forwards in time at the same time. So <laughs> depending on what character you're with, the music is mimicking that as well. So you hear these two different backwards and forwards layers on top of each other and that it needs to complement each other. It's kind of an intellectual exercise as well as a kind of emotional one. How it felt intellectual was just that I had to learn and had to do research and I had to read books and I had to go back to read music theory again. But it was always very important to me that the music that came out was nothing sounding like intellectual music at all. Like I, I wanted it to kind of have always have an emotional gravitas to it. And it's propulsive as hell. It really propels you through that movie. Yeah, yeah. The way that Chris works with time and how he manages to explain to me and how is how the music ties together different scenes and how we can propel it with the score and how we can build up climaxes was I, I, it's such an interesting journey and, and big lesson for me. Did that also have to be recorded during the pandemic period? I recorded most of it before the pandemic, but then. About 30% of the score was recorded in the middle of the pandemic. So when you needed the orchestra for Tenet, Mm -hmm. and it was in the pandemic period, how did you do it? That was one of the big challenges because Chris and I knew that we're not going to be able to go back to the scoring stage. This was in March, so everything was closed down. And I came up with the idea of recording each one of the musicians in their own house and give them recording equipment, let them borrow your recording equipment if they need it. And so... My team drove around LA, letting out recording equipment, setting up microphones in people's houses. And we recorded, I think, about a 60-piece orchestra this way. My engineer putting all the 50 tracks together and trying to make it sound like they're in the room together. Me listening to it, giving notes, sending the notes back to the musicians, them recording it again, them sending the recording back to the engineer him sending recording to me, listening to it, another note. Three days later, giving that note to the musicians, then recording it again, sending it to my engineer, him sending it to me. And then I need to tweak something in bar 75 because it was not perfect. I had to give that note to my orchestrator. Orchestrator put it in the sheet music, sending it out to the musician. They record it one by one. They send all the tracks to the engineer. He puts all of them together, he sends it to me, I'm listening again. This took about two months to just get a three minute cue exactly the way I wanted it to sound. Wow, that's amazing. It was so much work and it took so much time. Everyone you know, was exhausted by the end because it was this three minute cue that was extremely important to get right because I wanted the whole orchestra to sound like they were playing in reverse. And the only way to do that is to take the theme, write it out in sheet music, reverse the the sheet music, 
and then also reverse the dynamics. So what normally would be soft in a note, they would hit it extra hard with the, like a forte piano, like a, with a hard attack. And it then do a diminuendo on the long notes. After four or five takes, we got it perfectly. It really <laughs> sounds like a full orchestra sitting together, playing backwards in time. It's very interesting because they don't sound like they're playing together in the big room. This, it's never going to sound like a traditional orchestra sound. It's going to sound very strange and weird and extremely fitting for the, 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 the sound world of Tenet. And, you know, the, the, it was actually a very successful experiment that just made um, the score even sound more special, fortunately for us. Wow. What are you working on now? I'm going to work on, on my own music for a little bit just to just write music for myself and not just get my ideas out there. I think it'll be feel very therapeutic. Will this be an album under your own name? I think it'll be an album. One of the big challenges is how to sing well and how to write lyrics. I'm so bad at it. And, <laughs> but I think through different production techniques, I can kind of hide my voice and tweak it and then... Maybe you'll laugh when you hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I think, frankly, we just kind of can't wait to hear it. So, um, thanks. But listen, we wish you luck, and we can't thank you enough for for being here and talking to us today. It's such a fun conversation, and I can't wait to do it again. Thank you for listening to Four Scores. Please subscribe and make sure to share this episode with your music-loving friends would also be great if you could rate it, because that really helps others find the series. Check out The Mandalorian on Disney Plus and listen to the soundtrack wherever music is enjoyed. <laughs>